Okay, enough of the levity. Hi, I'm Jim and I'm an alcoholic. Hey, Jim. My sobriety date is July 25th, 1987. I am sober by the grace of God, a 12-step program, sponsors, and many loving people who have helped me throughout my journey. I am humbled that I've been asked to share my testimony with you tonight. Thank you, Curtis and Sarah, for that. I am the youngest of three. I have two older sisters, and both my parents have since passed away. My dad was an accountant, and my mom was a stay-at-home mom. Growing up, my dad was a good provider when it came to material things. We had more than we needed. It was so important to my parents to have that outside appearance of success. This attitude rubbed off on me, and at a young age, I started believing that material things were most important. At an early age, I was taught that I did not air our dirty laundry to anyone. We kept those things private, and to never question anything my parents did or said. If I did, I would suffer the consequences. This made me feel that my opinion was of no value and instilled in me a fear of my parents. I couldn't understand why this didn't apply to so much with my sisters, maybe because they were older than me. They were free to express their opinions all the time, but I was not, which, as time went on, only added to my feelings of being less than. I didn't feel I fit into my family. I started to feel that I was nothing more than a pain in their butts. I would never be able to do anything right or ever please them. I truly thought that it really didn't matter to my family if I was there or not. I sought approval but never received it. I was told I was stupid, and I believed it. I didn't really have a close relationship with any of my family. The seed had been planted and from an early age. These same feelings stayed with me into adulthood, not only with family, but people outside of family. It was very difficult for me to feel that, that I fit in anywhere and with anyone. I was lost on the inside, but kept that outward appearance of being okay. Growing up, alcohol was always around in the house. My parents threw many parties and seemed to have fun, had fun most of the time. There were many times over the years that my dad would come home drunk after playing golf, and I would hear a lot of arguing behind closed doors. When I was 10, there was a night that my dad came home drunk. My mom woke my sister and I up from asleep to show us how drunk he was. He proceeded to knock my mom out, at that moment, I had lost any respect for my dad and mom. He hit a woman, and she left her children. My mom left for about six months. During that time, if anyone asked about my mom, I was told to say that she was down in Florida helping my oldest sister. While mom was gone, my one sister, who was only two years older, was put in charge of me. That in itself was a nightmare. When, the, when mom returned, I don't remember any more arguments, and whatever mom said went. At this point, I felt even more distant from my family. I can remember thinking to myself that my oldest sister was the lucky one. She escaped. However, what I didn't know at the time was that she was battling with her own issues, and that, and that my parents were doing the best they were capable of doing. I was so wrapped up with self that I really didn't think of anyone else. Looking back, this was a great mindset I used to fuel and justify my drinking. I took my first drink when I was seven years old. I had my first drunk when I was 12. I stole a bottle of Southern Comfort from my dad's liquor cabinet along with some soda and got drunk with a friend of mine. I remember the next day thinking to myself, I'll never do that again, and it didn't and I didn't until I reached high school. I still never knew where I fit in during high school. I enjoyed playing basketball and golf, but there was some, something still missing. This is where I crossed that proverbial line into my alcoholism. I had finally found out what was missing in my life. It was alcohol. As time went on, I became more interested in where I would get my next drink and less interested in anything else. Though still living at home, I was, in a sense, restricted with my drinking. But as time went on, drinking became the most important thing in my life. 
I started college, played basketball, and during my freshman year, I fell in lust and I found a hostage, better known as a girlfriend. At the beginning of my second year of college, my dad and I had a huge argument about whatever, and he told me if I didn't like it, there's the door, so I left and moved in with my girlfriend's family. I quit school and found a full-time job. About a month later, I received a reimbursement check for tuition. I had to make an appointment with my dad's secretary to return the check to him. I only returned it because I was too scared not to do so. He said to me then that if I continued the way I was living my life, I could forget about having his money, the country club, the lifestyle, etc. I thought for a moment to myself, and I decided to move back home. I realize now that the material things at that time meant more to me than people did. I went away to college the next year thinking to myself, things were going to be different this time. It was my parents, girlfriend, friends, and hometown that were at the root of all my problems. What I didn't realize was that I was taking myself with me. I joined a fraternity and my drinking escalated. I cared very little for anything. I barely graduated and was hired to teach in a little town in West Virginia. Once again, thoughts, thoughts of it will be different this time came, and I blame college for my problems. I'll show you it'll be different this time, I thought, again forgetting I was taking me with me. I started teaching and soon found out that my boss drank just like I did and we soon became good friends. I saw nothing wrong with drinking moonshine on my lunch break with her and the secretary. I justified that if my boss was doing it, it was okay to do. The school closed down at the end of this school year. They said it was due to lack of enrollment, but I don't think that was true because that same year my boss was retired. I was transferred to another school and once again I believed things would be different. It was my bo old boss and secretary that were the problem. At this point in my life, I was incapable of being honest for anything and taking responsibility for anything I did. I was so scared to drink at my new school. I was too afraid of getting caught. If I got fired, then how could I afford to drink? In my second year at this school, I had an affair with a parent of one of my students. At the time, I saw no problem with this, but her husband did. He told me I had two choices. I could either leave at the end of the school year and never return, or that this day could very well be my last. I know I made the right choice. <laughs> I moved to Florida where my parents were now living. I was asked why I moved to Florida, and I told them I missed them. With that, my dad looked at me and, I said, and he said, did they kick you out of the state? Everyone who knew me knew what I had become but me. My alcoholism had been in control for a while, and I was in complete denial. Thoughts once again that things would be different crept in. I got a job to teach in January of 84 and have been in Florida ever since. In 85, I got my first EUI, and of course, it was not my fault. I justified that the police were picking on me, and they had to make their quota. The fact I blew a .3 on the breathalyzer had nothing to do with it. I had to report to corrections on a regular basis, along with attending AA meetings. In May, I reported to my counselor, showed her my signed AA meeting sheet, and I told her all the things I thought she wanted to hear. At the end of our session, she told me she was proud of the progress I was making. It's the first time in a very long time anyone had told me they were proud of me. Knowing what the consequences would be if I got another DUI, I celebrated by getting my second DUI that night. I had to see that woman the very next week, and I knew there was nothing I could say to her that she would believe. I hired a lawyer, took a leave from work, and went to treatment. I thought if I went to treatment, it would fool the judge, and I wouldn't have to go to jail. The thought of jail terrified me. I just wanted everyone off my back. I didn't want to get sober. It was still everyone else's fault, not mine. I did just enough not to get kicked out of treatment. Two days before the, my time was up, we were taken to an AA meeting in Delray Beach. I saw a guy who had just left treatment 
two days prior. He was, a confident, he was confident when he left treatment and said he would go to any length to stay sober. That night he was scared to death of drinking again. The look on his face scared me and I begged the treatment center to let me stay, but there were no beds available. They did, however, find a halfway house that had a bed. I stayed there a few months and attended AA meetings daily. I got a sponsor and went through the steps. I did a lot of service work and was involved with young people's groups and functions. Habits die hard, I still needed a drink. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I, sorry. <laughs> no, I'm not. Everything in my life was better than it had ever been. I was finally happy. I was told not to make any major decisions the first year of my sobriety. At six months, I started dating a girl who also had six months. That added up to a year, and in my mind, it was fine. We got engaged and my priorities changed. Making money in the relationship was more important than a sponsor or as many meetings. Sobriety was losing its value and I didn't even know it because I was still just not drinking. The engagement was broken off. I was miserable inside and I wouldn't tell anyone how I felt. On Saturday, July 25th, 1987, I went to go to a meeting. I got to the door. I turned around and walked away. I went to a bar and got drunk. The next day, there was a nothingness inside of me that I had never felt before. I called the last person I thought I would ever call if I went back out. He asked me, why did you drink? I paused and I said, I drank because I wanted to drink more than I wanted to stay sober. Those were the first honest words that this alcoholic had spoken in years. I had no excuses left no lies I could believe, nor could I justify my drinking. I remind myself of that every day, still today. Getting sober was my last chance. I started going to a lot of meetings and did a lot of service, but I was scared. I let people know that I didn't think I could stay sober. People would tell me that they believed I could stay sober, and I hung on to that. In a few months, I didn't have to be told this. I started to believe it myself. My whole attitude and outlook on life had begun to change. When I was sober about four years, a friend of mine asked if I was dating anyone, and I said no. She said I, she knew somebody, and she wanted me to meet them. I told her I didn't want to go on a blind date. I finally agreed to meet her at a meeting. That was a safe place. After the meeting, feeling like a teenager, and I was 34 at the time, I got enough courage to ask her for her phone number. We started dating, and on July 10th, 1993, we were married. We just celebrated 30 years. Best blind date ever. <laughs> Throughout our marriage, there has been many, many ups and downs. We have gotten through them all by working our own programs and, and treating each other with love, dignity, and respect. We wanted to start a family, but we were told by the doctors that there was really no chance we would ever be able to have kids on our own. Well, God had other plans for us. And on December 13th, 1997, my wife gave birth to our son. We were told his bilirubin count was high, but it should correct itself, so we brought him home. On Saturday the 20th, my wife noticed something uh, was just not right with our son. I met my wife in Jupiter, and a spinal tap was done on him. Then he was rushed to St. Mary's Hospital. He was poked and prodded so many times that he still has sensitivity on his foot. The doctors couldn't figure out what was wrong with him, and they told us that he probably was not going to survive. We were crushed. Up to this point, I believed in God, but I had no relationship with him. I always thought of him as a punishing God, not a loving and nurturing God. I told my wife I was going to have a cigarette, so I went outside and sat on the bench in front of the ER and proceeded to yell at God, telling him exactly what I thought of him and how dare he do this to us. I told God to take me and save my son. Then I went back upstairs to my wife, not telling her a thing that I said. 
The next day, our son pops his little head up, alert as can be, responding normally. The doctors were baffled and had no explanation. My wife and I knew why. It was God. Our son from birth has overcome so many life's obstacles. I'm so proud of the young man he's become. He is so filled with love and kindness for others and has a deep love for Jesus. What a blessing he is to so many others and us. Excuse me. Life was good. My wife and son started to attend church regularly, but I still wasn't interested. They started coming to COH. My wife gave me a Bible that I didn't open. I was sober 27 years and had a belief in God, but inside I knew something was missing. I wanted what I saw my wife and son had, a true relationship with God. That's what was missing in my life. From that point on, I began having a relationship with God, and it continues to grow stronger daily. I feel a joy in my heart that I have never felt before. Thank you, Jesus. On January 30th, 2015, I played golf with my brother-in-law, and normally when we finished, I would drop him off and go home. That day, I decided to go with him to see my niece. I got to her door, and I buckled over in pain. I knew I was having a heart attack. The paramedics came and thought it was just indigestion because nothing was showing on the EKG. They took me to Good Sam's. My wife, my wife met us there. I told her she needed to go get something to eat. I was going to be here for a while, so that's what she did. The last thing I remember was the nurse starting to do another test. My wife returned and was told I was taken to the cath lab. Then over the intercom, she heard the emergency, emergency room code blue. She didn't know anything of it, of it then because she knew I was in, she didn't think anything of it then because she knew I was in the cath lab. It just so happened that day there was a cardiac surgeon in charge of the ER. I had 100% blockage on one side, 80% blockage on the other. Two stents were put in. When I came to, I saw my wife and I immediately told her that everything was going to be all right. I felt the warm hand of God on my heart and I knew that he had more for me to do. That warm feeling has never left. From that moment on, there was no fear. I was at peace, and I had an even greater joy in my heart. I knew God had my back. We saw the cardiac surgeon, and he kept looking at the paperwork and then at me. He did this several times and finally asked me who was with me when this happened. I told him my brother-in-law. He told me I should buy him a case of beer. We shouldn't be having this conversation. I should be dead. Up to this point, we never realized that I had died. I had to ask my niece what beer to buy. I had no idea. I gave him, I gave him the beer and I told him it was doctor's orders. <laughs> I did everything I was told to do to prepare for surgery. Prior to surgery, the associate pastor came to visit us at the hospital. As he was leaving, God put on his heart to pray for just two. He didn't understand why, but he stopped in the chapel and prayed for just two. At the time, he didn't know I was having quadruple bypass surgery. Just before surgery, I prayed. I knew I was either going to go home to my house or to be with him. I preferred my house, but I knew it would be his will for me, not my will for me. I fully understood now who has always been in charge. My wife called the associate pastor after surgery to let him know everything went well. And in passing... Uh, that I had only a double bypass. The phone went silent, and then the associate pastor told my wife what God had put on his heart. Looking back, I now see that I had to experience everything I've experienced to get to this moment. I always thought that God had turned his back on me. Today I know that it was me who turned my back on him, and he has still loved me no matter what. I still make a lot of mistakes today, but I try to be the best gym I can be. Today I maintain my sobriety by keeping it simple. I don't drink, I go to meetings. I'm active in my home group, I sponsor others, and I have a sponsor. 
I have people I'm accountable to. I apply the principles of the 12 steps daily, and I pray a lot. Prayer is as important to me as food and water. It nourishes my soul and quenches the thirst I have for my relationship with Jesus. Daily, I thank him for yesterday's blessings and the unforeseen blessings today. When I step back, I realize everything, no matter how difficult or joyful, is a blessing. I ask him for the courage, wisdom, strength, and guidance to do whatever he, his will is for me today. I give him thanks at night for my sobriety, and I remind myself on a daily basis that I have done nothing to deserve this precious gift. It is only through God's grace and his love for me that I am sober today. Thank you for listening. God bless you all. And I didn't fall down the stairs. Wow. Oh, my goodness. Thank you so much for sharing. That was, that was incredible. Um, can we just please honor God one more time for the work he's done inside of this family? I had the pleasure of knowing their son before I met them, and he gives the best hugs. <laughs> <laughs> And I know after knowing you guys that the love he has comes directly from you guys. And thank you so much for sharing that experience, strength, and hope. That is incredible to see how God is working, continuing to work inside of your life and just has worked profoundly. Um, from somebody who didn't know how to, from somebody who didn't know how to be honest, to somebody who has had a complete transformation and now has a beautiful family, I am so grateful that you shared that. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Now tonight, um, guys, we're also doing our chips tonight because um, next week is Christmas, and so we're going to do them tonight. <laughs> and so we just got to hear the beautiful testimony of Jim, um, but there are so many people who are celebrating tonight. And so we're going to be celebrating together as a group tonight. Um, so if I can, please, already my chip huggers are up. So can we please um, honor my chip huggers right here? <laughs> but now we're going to be going through because we love to celebrate milestones here in recovery. And so if you guys have one day, one day you started to hear some experience, strength, and hope inside of the story you just heard, and you're like, you know what? I need to turn over my life. I need to commit to this program. I want to pick up a victory tonight, just as I heard expressed today. Would you please come and pick up a blue chip? All right, here we go. Yep. Good, good, good stuff. Yep. All ladies will come over this side, and all men will come over here. Excellent, excellent. Keep it going, keep it going. Awesome, 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 awesome. All right, next is our red chip. It's for 30 days. This is our hope chip. We're saying we now have a newfound hope as we are beginning to work our way through a recovery program. We're starting to dig into this community. We're starting to feel the support. We have a hope and we're living into it. Anybody celebrating 30 days, come and get a red chip. Yeah, here we go. Here we go. Nice. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Keep it going, keep it going. Nice. All right, next is our green chip. This is the growth chip. This is now for 60 days we have been working a recovery program. We are starting to feel the momentum as we are continuing to make the next right decision. We have the opportunity to move forward with that. Come and get it. Nice. Awesome, awesome. I love to say this. This actually starts to show that the grass is growing in between our house and the liquor store. And so we have growth in our recovery. <laughs> All right. Next is the white chip. This is for 90 days. 
Um, the white chip is for 90 days. This is our freedom chip. We're saying we now have a newfound freedom as we're starting to realize what recovery is doing for us and what our relationship with Christ is doing for us. We have freedom inside of our life. Come and get a 90-day chip. Here we go. Nice, nice. Awesome. All right, next is the yellow chip. I have a friend that would say it's not yellow because there's nothing yellow about getting recovery. However, we have to call it a color, and it is yellow. And so, <laughs> and so this is for six months. Many of us think, you know, when we find ourselves trapped inside of our addiction, trapped inside of our compulsion and our hurt, we think there is no possible way I could get six hours or six days, let alone six months. But here we are. We have six months of recovery working inside of our lives. Anybody celebrating this victory, come and get your yellow chip. What do we say? Keep coming, Keep coming back. That's right. Next is um, our black chip. It's, uh, it's our strength chip. This is for nine months. Anybody celebrating nine months saying that we are doing so good. Let's get it. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. Keep it going. Keep it going. Nice. Good stuff, good stuff. I love to see it. Love to see this. Awesome. Hugs and high fives all around. Loving it. Awesome. All right. Last is our gold coin. This is for a year or multiple years thereof, celebrating in December. Now, this is our coin for love because we love to celebrate what God is doing inside of our life. We realize that we love the community we're engaging with. We love receiving the support and the experience, strength, and hope that we get from coming to recovery. So anybody celebrating a year or multiple years thereof in the month of December, come and get a gold coin. Yeah, awesome. I, I'm going to leave uh, the gold chip in there because it's already been presented to me. It's already earned its 20 years. And now it's been given to me to add my 20. So it's a 40 year. Thank you, Larry. Awesome, awesome, awesome. That was just a quick testimony of the type of thing that you can experience in recovery. This, this type of thing that we have received freely and so we love to freely give. And so with all of the celebration that you guys have just seen, if anybody has had a stirring in their heart, you started to feel a little knot inside of your stomach, and you're like, I know I need to have the strength to go and get it. I see other people doing it. Stop worrying about what other people might think of you because there's going to be zero shame, zero guilt cast your way. It's only going to be love and support. And so anybody else having another opportunity to come and throw down your misery, pick up a victory, Come and get a blue chip. Here we go. Nice. All right. Good, good, good stuff. Let's hear it. Let's hear it. Let's hear it. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Guys, thank you so much for coming and celebrating tonight. Thank you so much for coming and creating a space for other people, let alone yourself, getting experience, strength, and hope. Can we please honor our chip huggers? <laughs> giving away, giving away hope. Good, good stuff. Thank you, guys. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right. Now we're going to go into um, our closing announcements for our large group. And so I just want to say, you guys have already made such a big impact tonight by creating a space for other people to come get experience, strength, and hope. 
Now, your attendance is a great way to give back, but here at Community of Hope, we also really appreciate it if you are able to give back financially. If you can, great. If not, we say keep coming back because you are giving in so many ways just by doing that. If this is your first time, please don't feel um, awkward that we're expecting you to come and give us money. That's not what we're here about. We're here to give away experience, strength, and hope in the form of recovery through Jesus Christ. But if you are able to give back financially, we say thank you so much for your your generosity. You can do that on the app, and you can also do that as you are exiting um, this large group, as there's going to be some people there to receive it. Um, next thing is our small groups, and so you just saw all these people celebrating so much of the strength they get to celebrate those milestones happens in the small groups. They happen in the meetings where we get the opportunity to go to gender-specific rooms and share what has been irking us. We get to share the victories we have, and we get to have the momentum carried along with us because other people are walking beside us while we do it. This is where that happens. So I really encourage you for all the men, um, we have chemical dependency on my left, your right, and then we also have men's open share. And then on my right, your left is going to be women's open share and then women's chemical dependency. If you have any questions about where you might need to go, you can find me, you can find Sarah, and we would love to help you navigate to the right spot. Um, and then last but definitely not least, we're going to go over my, one of my favorite prayers, which is the serenity prayer. So if you are able to, please stand, and we're going to read the serenity prayer together. All right. And help me out here. What does it say? God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Living one day at a time. Enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardship as a pathway to peace, taking as Jesus did the sinful world as it is, not as I would have it, trusting that you will make all things right if I surrender to your will so that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with you forever in the next. Amen. Get recovery.